I'm Julian Stevens, Managing Director of Sovereign Metals Limited. We're an ASX listed company developing the world's largest rutile project in Malawi in Africa. Julian, really nice to meet you. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, I know nothing about Sovereign Metals. I've, I, I've been to Malawi and I'm really looking forward to learning more about uh, your company and your project in the next uh, half an hour or so. Great to be here, Merlin. I'm uh, open book for you. <laughs> Good. Um, you're a geologist and you've worked in Malawi for ages. Um, I, I, I am and I have, yes. Uh, can you tell me what took you to Africa and kind of what projects you worked on? Just as a bit of background, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. Sure, sure. Well, I started my days in Africa. I'm, a, I'm actually a specialist gold geologist. Well, I once was. Uh, I started my days in Africa consulting in West Africa. Um, on numerous gold projects in uh, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, etc. And an opportunity came up in um, Malawi to work on a uranium project. And that seemed really interesting to me and something different. And uh, I uh, began uh, life in Southern Africa as exploration manager for, for a junior uranium exploration company in Malawi. That, that finished up and then I decided that I would look at a few projects uh, myself and with some partners privately. We did that and we actually found a, a graphite project, quite a large graphite project. And we ended up bending that into so what's now Sovereign Metals. Now, we took that graphite project to a, a pre-feasibility study at the time in about 2017, 2018, the, mar the market itself had gone off graphite a little bit. But we happened to uh, discover some natural rutile in the area at the time. So we had something naturally to move on to whilst the graphite market was quiet. And we uh, pursued that for a few years. We had a few hits and a few misses in the early days, like much of exploration does. But eventually we were, uh, we were able to uh, discover and now delineate the world's largest rutile deposit. Goodness, what a story. What a story. Um, and <laughs> I'm as um, surprised as, 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 as many others. <laughs> um, just a couple of questions. The, the uranium, was that the deposit you worked on? Was that um, Kalakira? It was not actually. Uh, and I have been to Kalakira, but it was on some uh, surrounding prospects slash deposits. We did discover a uranium deposit there. Uh, somewhat adjacent to Calicera, the same style of mineralization, but not not Calicera exactly. Okay, and then then back to the the, the, the graphite and the um, the rutile. Um, my experience of rutile is limited, and it's um, mineral sands. Um, it's it's the winnowing of um, of heavy minerals. Well, mineraling the winnowing of light materials um, away from uh, in, in an erosional context, the kind of they get the re the repeated winnowing of lighter minerals, and so you get this concentration of the of the heavy minerals, the ilmenites, the rutiles, um, the zircons. Um, is that the geological context that we're talking about here? It's different, uh, but but it. It, it forms part of the uh, the story is related to traditional mineral sands deposits, as, as you talk about, known generally as placer deposits, which are sand that has heavy, valuable heavy minerals in it that's been eroded off generally basement rocks, transported down rivers and deposited in placers, either in rivers or uh, shorelines, sand dunes, uh, etc. cetera, um, by uh, process wind generally wind and water um, uh, processes. Now, what we have in Malawi is something slightly different in that the rutile itself is actually at the source. So we've had a a um, in this case a crystalline rock called gneiss, and this gneiss has had uh, some rutile in it. The rutile the the rock has been weathered over millions of years. And, and in that weathering process, you get deflation of the profile. That deflation, as, as you have mentioned, has moved away lighter minerals by two methods. One, by a winnowing method, water and wind, 
And the second method is a chemical method where rainwater dissolves easily dissolvable minerals and, and moves them away. So those processes uh, cause uh, uh, deflation or loss of volume in this weathering profile, but because rutile is heavy and non-reactive, it doesn't react in, in, in the water, uh, it concentrates and kind of packs down in place. Now, this, this phenomenon has occur occurred over a very large plain in Malawi called the Lilongwe Plain. And so far, we've drilled about 180 square kilometres of, of this area and uh, been able to delineate the world's largest rutile deposit uh, across that area by two and a half times. It's, it's effectively in situ weathering and just that, as you say, that kind of accumulation, the, the, all of the, the lighter material gets chemically and physically removed and the, the, accumulate, the accumulation of the, of the rutile is in situ. Um, so deposit potential is where you've got um, the gneiss at surface, which is obviously, I mean, th this must be a process over millions of years. So you've got effectively a, the stable um, African craton and it's just been Correct. erosion, 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 um, and the less erosion, so, more weathering. Sorry, yes, yes, of course, because weathering the, as it, opposed it, to erosion. If if there was a yeah. lot of erosion, it would be gone. <laughs> exactly, erosion. Of course, you would have if you were on a kind of a, a high profile or a high, high elevation, but it's the stable craton which enables the weathering to take place in in, in situ. Um, is exactly. there variation? Is there variation laterally in the content of the rutile i mean in the protolith in in the in the original rock in the in the gneiss there must be bands or zones where there are higher grade portions um, with more rutile and then less rutile in other places and so how do you how do you differentiate this when you're trying to delineate resource on such a vast horizontal plane yes you're exactly right there are uh portions of barren gneiss there are portions of um let's say moderate grade uh, rutile and there are portions of, let's call it higher grade, say above 1% rutile in, in the original gneiss. Of course, the higher the original grade, the higher the upgraded rutile grade you get in, in the surface. But there is a kind of evening out effect because there's a mushrooming effect during that uh, deflation weathering process you, you get you get mixing of the regolith, regolith in the top sort of four or five meters, and that ends up giving you a more smooth. It ends up smoothing the grades in that top four or five meters, which is the real high grade sort of initial target area. So so like a kind of mushroom shape, a, a very a very short, very uh, very laterally extensive mushroom. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I, I, I can see the mushrooms. Um, my, my various family members would be able to tell me exactly what type they are, but uh, I, I know the ones. Um, <clears throat> um, sure, sure. Okay, interesting. And so th th you've talked about that being a kind of a four or five meter zone, and yet today you've put out some drill results talking about kind of deeper zones going down. Yeah, I, I saw what, what is it? Twenty eight meters. Twenty eight meters at one percent. So, so what are those depth um, extents all about? Talk to me about that drilling and what that what that means. Okay, so these are where we, if you think about a, a traditional weathering profile, we'll have um, what we call ferruginous pedolith, which is the top uh, three or four or five metres that I spoke about, a mottled zone, meaning uh, saprolite or mottled saprolite. So that's kind of ferruginous saprolite. All of this material is... Uh, friable, free digging, etc., And then we go into what's called saprolite proper, which is still weathered, uh, friable material. And that's uh, where we've intersected these sort of thicker uh, intercepts of uh, say 20 or 30 meters at 1.1, 1.2%, etc. So what do those, what do those deeper zones of um, that plus 1% rutile mineralization mean? Well, they're the, they're the sort of core. I won't call them feeder zones because that's not right. This, this, this is not a hydrothermal deposit or anything like that, but they are the core source uh, source zones of, 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 the, of the rutile, I guess. So the, the, those are the higher bands, the, the, the higher rutile, the, you know, the, the portions of the... Uh, higher of, 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 Yes. So um, 
what is it? I haven't done that. Um, so, so it'd be the, the, the um, leucocratic and the melanocratic zones within a night, you know, the, the darker zones and the lighter zones. And so effectively, this would be the darker zone. Poten- yes, potentially, yes. Um, Rutile's a dark mineral, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it is a dark mineral, but there's, there's not so much of it in the material to impart uh, the dominant uh, shade <laughs> to, to, the, to the material. It's actually quite light. The, the high-grade material is actually quite light coloured, uh, a light grey, even white in places. Uh, sorry, the, the high grade, sap, deeper saprolite. Yeah, and yeah. the saprolite effectively is the is the protolith. I mean, you can probably still still see some original features in the saprolite, can't you? You, you do. You can see the, uh, uh, and it's actually in the defin- definitions. You uh, can see the original fabric in it. However, all of the, um, what would you say? Uh, most of the silicate minerals uh, have been weathered to uh, clay. And that has made it uh, to a kaolin clay, and that is that makes this material soft and friable. Uh, it's actually it's actually re- remarkable. It looks, you know, a- and it looks quite uh, competent. But if you pick a piece of core up, uh, let's say in, in single hand out of the core tray, and just do that to it, it just disintegrates in your hand. Or pick a piece of core up and put it in a bucket of water, it just slakes away, like. Um, immediately, basically. H- hence your confidence that you can do this with hydraulic mining. Yeah, a- absolutely. Right. Okay. Now we've we've just gone straight down a geological um, uh, rabbit hole, uh, and that is we, always dangerous we, when you've got we, two we geologists indeed. speaking, <laughs> <laughs> two geologists <laughs> speaking to each other. But let's let's pull ourselves out and just just um um the the, the project is you've you completed this expanded um um scoping study and you're going into pre-feasibility study can you just kind of talk to me about that process sure sure uh the process has been uh we we announced an initial resource and we completed an initial scoping study uh very early last year now uh, in the Six months after that initial scoping study, we managed to triple the size of the resource. So we went from 600 million tonnes to 1.8 billion tonnes in, in, uh, in quite a short period. And for that reason, we decided it would be better to um, do another scoping study rather than go straight into a pre-feasibility study. The reason being there'd been such a scale change in the, in the uh, mineral resource. So we completed that uh, uh, that uh, sort of second or expand what we're calling expanded scoping study earlier this year, and uh, that showed that we would be able to produce something like two hundred fifty thousand tons a year of rutile for uh, on average for about twenty five uh, years, uh, using only about thirty five percent of that mineral resource. So. Um, we, we 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 artificially uh, well, say stopped the the modelling at twenty five years because as you know that doesn't really have uh, much effect on your your NPV or anything like that for for simplicity. But realistically, this is a fifty year or seventy year or hundred year mine at at that scale of, of two hundred fifty thousand odd tons of of rutile a year because there's just so much more resource and there's just so much more mineralization we know about and, and we may have drilled a little bit or we we may be confident is there but we just ha- have we had to stop drilling some at some point and and focus more on on the development pathway so that's that's what we're doing at the moment so you've re- you've reached um a scale which uh is so big that you can therefore optimize your a kind of a commercial development within that, uh, comfortable in the knowledge that the, the resource base runs. So when you, um, I, I, there's plenty more. Um, I saw somewhere that you're doing, um, uh, the, 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 I think it was in your quarterly report, you talked about uh, starting the, the, the pre-feasibility study and going on to a 12,000 meter uh, air core program. We've spoken a little bit about some of those results that you, um, uh, found so far, and that's essentially upgrading, um, upgrading the resource categories. Can you just tell me about kind of where you're putting that twelve thousand meters and, and what the plan is there? Sure, sure. So in our uh, resource, uh, 
uh, excuse me, in the uh, expanded scoping study uh, that we last reported, about half of the material, uh, about sorry, I should say, sixty percent of the material was in the indicated category, and forty percent of the material was in the inferred category that we used for the mining inventory for that study. Now, to convert that to a reserve in the upcoming pre-feasibility study, we would need one hundred percent of that mining inventory in at least the indicated category. So. At the moment, our focus is bringing up uh, that remaining 40% into the indicated category. And a secondary focus is drilling uh, deeper beneath the proposed pits, the proposed open pits, because we know mineralization extends to depth. And the uh, initial results uh, from the first 32 of 160 odd drill holes were, were reported today. Uh, to the market, and those results show that mineralisation indeed does extend deeper than previous drilling. And uh, in most pit areas, we should be able to extend the depths of the proposed pits. And uh, is the bottom of the mineralisation the kind of the the the, the start of the um, harder rock? You know, is, is is that the boundary? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, sap rock. Or some people in Western Australia, they'd call it tradition, uh, transitional material. Um, we, we call it sap rock, and really it's um, where the rock becomes more competent and uh, less weathered and therefore would not be able to be mined by uh, um, traditional mineral sands mining methods, uh, being in this case hydro mining, but, but you know, potentially dozer push mining but also would not be able to be processed in the uh, traditional, you know, mineral sands uh, processing methodology, which doesn't require any drilling, blasting, crushing or grinding, uh, because then you get into hard rock territory, which would make uh, that material would be an uneconomic so that, that none of that sap rock material would, would make the resource base. That's the base of mineralization. Do you have a preference to deep your pit? I mean, is it easier to do kind of shallow um, mining kind of, um, or, you know, five meters of mining, or is it, is it beneficial to have a 10 meter or a 15 meter pit? Um, just, just from a kind of a, an operational perspective. It would, it, it would be um, mining cost wise, mining cost wise, it would be beneficial to deepen the pits <clears throat> where possible, where the grade, where the retail grade warranted, uh, deep, warranted deepening those pits, meaning meaning you could stay more station your your mining uh, equipment could stay more stationary on the same pit for longer rather than moving all yes. of the time. Yeah, gotcha. And um, uh, forgive my ignorance, but they're on the, on the hydraulic mining, I've seen it operating in a few places. Um, I've seen it on some tails. I've seen it um, in in Cornwall actually on the on the China clay pits because the, the kaolin. Um, <clears throat> Is, is there enough water in, in Malawi to be able to do that? Good question. Uh, the answer is yes. There is, um, I guess, a, a reasonably discreet, it's, it's semi, it, it would, I'd call it semi-tropical, reason, reasonably discreet wet season in Malawi once a year. And the average is about 900 mils of water. And we would plan to capture that in a water dam uh, for our, as our main source uh, with supplementary sources we, we would recycle as much water as, as possible, obviously, but supplementary groundwater sources, if, if required, at the moment, they don't look to be required, but um, we would uh, make sure that they were there and available to us as well in, in the case of a, of a drought or something like that. Is, is, the, is the kind of the water balance uh, test work kind of quite advanced? Because I can imagine that water is an emotive um, subject in a country like Malawi. But very emotive, freshwater provision is very, very important. Uh, is the water balance, uh, it's, it's advancing, I would say. It's, it's about where you would expect it to be um, in a pre-feasibility study. At the moment, we are doing a large um, hydrogeological drilling program as well as the, the resource upgrade program. Um, so we are doing, uh, I guess, numerous hydrogeological uh, boreholes and and monitoring, pump testing, and those uh, sort of activities. What's the reception been from the from the mines ministry? Uh, I mean, you know, have they been saying, "Oh, don't go near water; you, you won't get that permitted," or uh, you know, have they been pushing you towards the kind of the dozer route, or have they been saying, "Just do the work. Let's see what let's see what works best for 
the project? No, they haven't been pushing us down one one route or the other. They're um, happy and with us doing the work and um, highly supportive of us um, um, and the and the project itself. Thank you. Now, one of the things which we haven't spoken about is the graphite, because in in this in this um, you talk about producing two hundred and fifty. I think the scoping study eventually, when you get up to phase two, will be two hundred sixty thousand, two hundred sixty four thousand tons per annum of of of, of natural rutile. Um, there's also talk of 170,000 tons per annum of graphite. Can you tell me how this this fits in? Is that also part of a, the 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 um, the weathering process on the on the nicers, or is this something else? Uh, okay, funnily enough, well, it, it, it's a it's a full circle type story. Um, as as I mentioned at the start of the of our uh, chat, we originally started exploration for graphite. Actually, the graphite led us to Rutile, and um, there is an association of graphite, a, lo a, a loose association of graphite and Rutile in these in this material on the Lilongwe Plain, and in particular in the Cassia deposit. That being the case, uh, it the graphite is relatively low grade, but mining the tons that we are looking at putting through starting with 12 million tons <clears throat> and uh, upscaling to 24 million tons in, in phase two of the proposed uh, development, we would be able to uh, produce at, in, in, in stage two 170,000 tons of, of graphite. Now it's quite, it starts off as quite low grade at 1.3% in the resource, but, um, and, and you don't get, <clears throat> you don't get, um, particularly high recovery. So the recovery is about 60 to 65% because you're not going through a traditional graphite flow sheet. But uh, nonetheless, it is a substantial amount of graphite and it adds uh, um, some quite significant revenue to the project. So it's a very, very valuable byproduct for us in this project. You say there's an association between rutile and graphite. Um... Uh, I always associate graphite as being a kind of very friable, uh, uh, not the kind of material that's going to survive a what you call kind of deflation and kind of um, w w chemical and physical weathering. Um, how has it survived? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so what we do see is we see depletion of graphite in the top three to five metres in that zone where rutile is concentrated. But as we get deeper into, say, the 8 to 10 to 12 metre range, uh, the graphite grade picks up and the flakes uh, get larger. And once you're down to about 8 metres, you have no degradation of graphite flakes at all. And in fact, they are highly crystalline, uh, coarse flake, and um, all sitting in this, in this friable matrix. Okay. So, um, presumably, phase one uh, is is let's say let's you, you you've got the half the tonnage, which is twelve million tons. So, phase one is going to be higher in rutile and lower in graphite, and then when you double the tons, you you get. Am I wrong? No, no, because the, the, these pits are so shallow that you'd mine fifteen meters in a you'd mine the entire pit in a single face, if you like. You you might you'd be mining. The top material and the lowest material all in one in one go, and mining a pit out, and then moving to the next pit rather than mining the tops off every. Pit. Of course, yeah. of course, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. so you have a uh, you, you you would have a um, what, what was a suitable blend uh, and a balance of of uh, 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 rutile and graphite in in um, all in. All. Uh, and you've, you've done all the recovery work. I mean, I'm slightly allergic to graphite. I know that people can't money on it, but um, just because principally because I because I can't understand it. I, I find it difficult to understand, and I therefore find it hard to trust things I don't understand. But you, you, you've you've done the the um, you've presumably done the test work, and you've done kind of you've, you've done the it, it, is Mitsui doing any of the um, the graphite offtake, or is that relationship all on the rutile? Uh, at the moment, it's only on Rutile, but we are in discussions with them and other off-takers about taking graphite as well, or other potential off-takers, I should say. In terms of test work, we've done, a, I guess, significant bulk test work on this material. 
and we, we, we had, I guess, hypothesised, us, us geologists, not being metallurgists, but us geologists on the site, when, when we, we saw this material, we have our own wet concentrating tables on site to process drill samples. As soon as you put this material on the, on the wet table, on site, the graphite goes straight to the tailings fraction. It goes to the lightest tailing, tailings fraction because we now know, gra well, not we now know, but because graphite is one, quite coarse flake in this instance, and two, it has a relatively low density. So it goes to the lightest tail fractions. So we postulated on site seeing this behaviour, rutile is the heaviest mineral in the system, graphite's the lightest mineral in the system, that they'd be easy to separate uh, with this, uh, with a traditional um, wet gravity process. Uh, we, we're using wet tables on site, but in, in the laboratories, um, in the commercial laboratories, they generally use spirals. And indeed that has, has uh, come to pass and been proven in our metallurgical test work in that it's very easy to separate the gravity, uh, with, with gravity, a light tail stream that contains the majority of the graphite and a heavy, mineral concentrate, which contains all of the rutile. So quite you know, extremely, extremely simple concept that does, does work uh, in reality as well. And um, when it comes to the processing plant, the kind of the, the process flow sheet, um, I know that uh, quite a lot of these, the, the mineral science projects have got their kind of electrostatic kind of the SART plants or whatever it is, you know, they, 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 they that's particularly for the zircon, but is your flow sheet just spirals and and kind of simple gravity separation? No, we still need the dry for for the rutile. We still need the uh, mineral separation plant or the dry component because we have some what the, what we call junk heavy minerals that go into the heavy mineral concentrate that need to be removed. For example, iron oxides. So the easy way to remove those is with uh, magnetics. And then we have another mineral in the in the system, another heavy mineral. It's an aluminosilicate called kyanite, and we need to remove that as well. And that's removed um, by electrostatic, by an electrostatic uh, separation technique. Uh, and the lucite kyanite. But overall, but overall, relatively simple. And we're only producing one heavy mineral product, so so quite simple. You know, we're not producing a zircon and an ilmenite and a leucoxine and a high grade zircon and a low grade zircon a single heavy mineral product being premium rutile. Fantastic. That's what, what, what we all want. Um, now, logistics, to get this thing to the coast, you've got to put it on a rail line. And what, what are the distances? I see in your presentation, you've got um, the, the, the capital of Malawi is Lilongwe. You've got the, 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 the resources to the west of Lilongwe. And then you've got these two rail lines. One kind of goes out to Nakala, which is uh, kind of northeast Mozambique and the other one is Tabera, which is kind of south um, kind of central south central um, Mozambique um, ports that's correct we, we're very very lucky um, we are, are in a landlocked um, African country Malawi however we have some fantastic infrastructure there of, of from which the project will benefit substantially and a, a key piece of that infrastructure is the rail line you speak about um, called the Nakala Corridor, uh, which uh, is a trans-Malawi and trans-Mozambique railway line that goes out to the deep water port of Nakala. Now, that's about a 900 kilometre haul. However, the rail line uh, is in existence and in operation and has recently just been upgraded by uh, the rail concessionaire, and I believe a, a package from, from Japan as well. So that um, hauls coal from Mozambique, from um, uh, Moatis, and it also hauls uh, export and import freight uh, to, in, to, uh, to Malawi and from Malawi for export. Have they got the capacity on the line to take an extra quarter of a million tonnes a year? Yeah, so it will be, uh, we would total about 400,000 tonnes of product a year at full production, uh, something like 250,000 tonnes of rutile and 100, so 170,000 tonnes of graphite, so say so 420,000 tonnes. The rail capa export capacity is 20 million, uh, 25 million tonnes, I should say, 
5 million tonnes of that, uh, 20 million tonnes of that is reserved for coal, 5 million tonnes is reserved for Malawi originating export freight. And at the moment, only about 10% of that capacity is being used, uh, mainly, mainly for agricultural products. So there is significant capacity on that rail line and we have a MOU in place with the rail concessionaire and we're working with them to bring that up to a uh, full take or pay um, uh, export, uh, freight export agreement uh, as the project uh, gets closer to development. What did you use in your um, scoping study as the kind of the, either the total cost or the cost per tonne per kilometre? Uh, I don't know what the cost per tonne per kilometre, but I do know what the total transport cost is and 55 US dollars per tonne. But uh, that includes a, a short truck in the early years to the rail railhead as well. Okay. Uh, and then later you would want to put in a spur. Yeah. So so at stage two, we are proposing a 12-kilometre spur line that would go essentially right to the plant. So we'd be loading straight onto rail uh, carriages uh, at the plant is the plan. Interesting. And um, obviously there's some pretty scary stuff going on in Cabo Delgado up in the northeast of, of, of Mozambique, uh, which is the province above the province where Nakala is. is. Is there any kind of filtering down of security, security concerns in Mozambique and around Nakala? We haven't heard of anything around Nakala. We did hear of a incident uh, at a mine in Mozambique a few months ago, uh, relatively isolated, but um, for, for us, we don't think that's an issue for the rail line at the moment. Um, we haven't seen any any evidence to that end. On, on the, you know, I guess there is a um, another option for us, and you spoke about it before, and that's exporting south via the Bayra corridor. So we are we're examining that as well, but we we don't um, see any any issues at this point. Great. Um, what's the what's the timeline for their pre feasibility study? Because um, you know, you 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 you've got some drilling coming out at the moment. I just wonder what the news flow looks like over the next six to nine to twelve months. You know, what do you get? What are the what are the delivery milestones, please? Sure, sure. So, key delivery milestone. Uh, delivery milestone one, I guess, over the next uh, six months is the upgraded mineral resource estimate. And we expect that in February, and then we expect the pre-feasibility study to be completed off the back of that by May. In between now and then as well, we are working hard on getting some more offtake agreements signed up with uh, potential offtake partners. We're finding a lot of interest in this product or products, uh, in particular Rutile, because it is in significant supply deficit. Um, there's a, we, we, perhaps we didn't talk about the commodity very much really, but rutile is the, the world's purest natural form of titanium and key markets are the pigment market. So basically rutile replaced uh, lead in, in white pigments. Uh, so that is uh, a significant market or the biggest market for rutile. And then it also goes into welding rods, a very important component of the flux in welding rods. And the other significant market is the titanium metal market, which is going through significant growth uh, at, at the moment. Yes, we haven't spoken about the commodity. I, I see that um, I see that Iluka is trying to demerge Sierra Rutile at the moment. Well, they have demerged Sierra oh, Rutile. So, 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 Sierra the, Rutile is its so, own. It's, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm behind the times. I thought they were still voting it's, on it's it. It's all but... happened. It's all happened. It's, it's all it's all done. All done. All finished. Yeah. And amazing. They kind of picked it up, integrated it, and then spat it out again a couple of years later. Indeed, uh, quite a quite interesting story, really. Good. Well, thank you very much. It's been really, really fascinating. I, I wish you um, all good luck with that. I look forward to um, keeping up the news flow. Presumably, you'll be working on um, offtake agreements as well on the graphite as well. Have you done any? Um, kind of bulk sampling to enable kind of um, commercial uh, testing to be done on your graphite products? Uh, the answer is yes. And we are in the process of producing those graphite products now uh, in in the lab to be able to send out to off-takers for their assessment. And have you got a pr 
preferred uh, market for this? I mean, are you trying to um, avoid geopolitics or are you trying to kind of get into um, Western supply chains? I think the answer is that we will look at all markets and um, avoiding geopolitics. Uh, I'm not quite sure what your angle is there, but uh, <laughs> would, 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 he, would we sell to China? Yes, yes we would. Um, is that likely to be our major market? Probably not. Okay. Yeah, that, that was basically the question. Um, <clears throat> Good. Well, um, <laughs> Julian, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, good luck with everything and um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Melon. Be great chatting to you.